Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen, the director of the National Security Studies Program here. Uh, very happy to uh, introduce our speaker, Kim Gaddis, who, of course, as you know, is a BBC correspondent uh, covering the State Department. She's got a new book, The Secretary, uh, which has been reviewed in pretty much every uh, American newspaper. And uh, I started reading last night and found absolutely riveting. Um, and Kim will speak about some of the big themes of the book. I'll engage her in some Q&A and then throw it open to you. Kim. Great. That was a fast introduction. Yeah. I'll do the talking now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for um, coming. Uh, it's, very, uh, it's been a very interesting experience for me, uh, talking to real audiences. I'm usually sitting in a TV studio talking straight into a camera. Um, so it's been lovely to give talks around town, um, and actually speak to uh, my audience and, and my readers. So I thank you for um, coming. This is a book which um, started um, gelling in my mind sometime in uh, 2010. Um, I'm a State Department correspondent for the BBC. I travel with the Secretary of State around uh, the world, as many of my American colleagues have done over the last few decades. Uh, the State Department, the Secretary of State travels with a small press corps. But I found that I was in a rather unique position because I wasn't uh, an American covering an American Secretary of State. I wasn't even fully a Westerner. Um, I was someone who, had, who was born in Beirut uh, during the Civil War there. Um, I grew up, in essence, on the receiving end of decisions made in Washington. And so I found myself in a very unique position, having lived with the consequences of decisions made in Washington. I was now in the US, traveling around the world with the Secretary of State, watching some of those decisions made, sometimes in front of me, uh, sometimes literally on the fly. So I, I want to just start my, my little talk by reading you um, the first couple of paragraphs from um, the book. I know this is not a reading, but um, they do set the tone um, and they lay out some of the themes that I try to address in, in this book. I grew up in Beirut on the front lines of a civil war. My father always said, if America wanted the fighting to end, the war would be over tomorrow. He waited 15 years for the guns to fall silent. From 1975 to 1990, everybody waited while 150,000 people died. Did America not care that people were being killed? Did it not have the power to stop the bloodshed? Were we just a pawn in the hands of the neo-colonial imperial power? And why were we all blaming this distant land for our war anyway? As a child, I never imagined I would one day live in that distant land and would be able to put some of those questions to the American Secretary of State herself, Hillary Clinton. As a reporter in the State Department press corps, I would even fly from Washington to Beirut with her on an aging American government plane, which contrasted somewhat with my image of an omnipotent superpower. So those few paragraphs tell you broadly the three themes or the three narratives that keep this book going over the course of um, its pages and its chapter. This isn't a dry policy book. Um, it isn't a book by a pure insider, someone like Vali Nasser, for example, who will be coming out with his own book, who's been at the table when some of those decisions um, have been made. Uh, but it is an inside account, and it is the first account, uh, the first draft of history, if you will, uh, of, America, of Hillary Clinton's time as Secretary of State. Um, and although in Washington we love the minutia of policy making, um, and every insider take that we can, um, that we can get. Um, I found that the value added that I brought to the book was also my ability to remain an outsider as someone who had grown up outside of Washington and outside of the US. So it's an unusual book for, uh, for a Washington audience, uh, perhaps. But I did want to write it both for my peers here uh, and also for a wide audience uh, across the US. Over the last a uh, few weeks I've taken time out of my day job to talk about the book. Um, and I've been um, humbled and flattered and, and impressed by the feedback that I've gotten, uh, not just in Washington, but also 
across the United States. I've given radio interviews to small radio stations from Toledo to Albany to St. Louis to, um, to Tampa and, um, and, uh, and LA. Um, and what I found was that there was a real interest um, that we forget about sometimes in, in Washington, a real interest in understanding those bigger questions and how the world is connected. You know, people read the headlines, but they can't always make sense of what it necessarily means for them and their lives, uh, wherever they are in the US. So these are big questions um, that weigh on the minds of uh, Americans. And we forget that sometimes when we're very busy with our day-to-day -day coverage uh, of the big issues in the US. Um, we sometimes forget that it doesn't really matter always how a decision was reached. Uh, people are living with the consequences, uh, whether it's in the US, you know, people who've had to fight in wars abroad, uh, or whether it's in the Middle East or other countries from Pakistan to, to China that are just seeing the end result of the decision um, that was made. Of course, for uh, foreign policy analysts, we want to understand how it was made. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that for real people, the, the general audience that I'm trying to reach, um, they are simply living uh, with the decision that was made. And then, because I am from outside the US, I also wanted to address an international audience uh, with my book. Um, and they have several variations of the questions that are being asked in the US about American power um, and what it really means today in the 21st century and how much power America still has. You know, Americans wonder, you know, to what extent should the US still be involved abroad? To what extent should it interfere, uh, try to save every, every person that's calling for help, stop every conflict that erupts, whether it's Syria or, or Libya? Um, you know, there are enough problems in the US that uh, Washington is trying to deal with. There are enough um, budget issues that the, you know, the average American doesn't understand why money has to be spent abroad on anything at all. Uh, even though, of course, uh, the amount spent abroad is much less than people usually um, think it is. And so for my audience abroad, I wanted to attempt to demystify a little bit uh, this foreign policy machine uh, because there is an illusion or a perception. Let's start with the word perception first. There is a perception abroad um, that because America is the superpower, it pulls all the strings, pushes all the buttons, and makes uh, happen whatever it wants to see happen. And to some extent, of course, that is correct because America is the biggest superpower and it has more power than uh, most other countries combined. Um, but it is very often, as we see in Washington uh, itself with domestic politics, it's very often difficult for the president uh, to get things moving. It requires a lot of heavy lifting, whether he's having discussions in Washington about the sequestration or whether he's having discussions with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Mahmoud Abbas in the Middle East. Um, occasionally you see progress, but it requires um, a lot of heavy lifting. And it is something um, that is often difficult to grasp when you are living in Beirut or, or Pakistan or Afghanistan uh, or even China, um, I, have, I have found. Um, and so in my travels, I found that I was in this unique position where I could bridge the gap between the illusion and the perception and the reality, uh, whether it was for a US audience or whether it was for um, an international audience, and try to really demystify that foreign, poli foreign policy machine, uh, explain to people how it really works to you know, the best of my ability. I mean, I'm, I don't pretend to have um, all the answers. Um, but I did feel that it was important to address both audiences in the US um, and, uh, and abroad. Um, I want to read you another very quick passage uh, from uh, the book that sort of tells you a little bit um, how people abroad perceive the power um, that the US has. And it isn't always about um, rejecting the US per se because it is the US. It is, it is often, it is sometimes, uh, people have a different worldview or a different perception of what the US should be doing abroad or not. Um, but I have found also that it is often because people simply don't understand why the US doesn't do what they want it to do. Um, and so I've gotten a lot of interesting comments and reactions from uh, this little passage, which I will read you now. Um, and um, I write this um, around the time when 
the U.S. administration, the first uh, during the first term of President Obama, is trying to uh, get the peace process moving, and uh, nothing um, is moving. So I write, I still wondered whether, whether one of the reasons countries and people were so often disappointed in the United States was their unrealistic expectation of what the US should and could do. Governments everywhere that instinctively and narrowly pursued their national interests somehow expected the United States to suspend the pursuit of its own interests to please them. The Arabs wanted the United States to ditch the Israelis. The Israelis wanted the United States to bomb Iran. The Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad wanted Obama to wait with him for the Shiite Messiah. Hmm. Pakistan wanted to be given Afghanistan on a gold platter. India wanted the United States to say it could have Kashmir. Japan wanted Washington to make Beijing go away. Countries seemed to forget that the United States had different layers of overlapping interests that it needed to align. And very often I found that the frustration that leaders showed with the U.S. was that they didn't understand why the U.S. couldn't make um, their rivals move. You know, the, the Turks don't understand why the U.S. can't simply make Israel apologize. We've seen the apology uh, come out today, but it's taken two years uh, to get there. Um, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is... Um, you know, has, there's been a lot written about it, and I don't delve into it in too many details. I didn't want to relitigate all of um, the peace process. Um, but just very simply on a human level, on a human interaction level, um, the Israelis don't understand why the Americans can't just make the Palestinians do something, and the Palestinians don't understand why the Americans can't make the Israelis uh, do whatever they want them to do. Um, and it's the same thing over and over um, again the, uh, around the world. So. I try to tell the story from a human perspective, from my observation, with my own personal narrative woven in throughout the book to make this an accessible read to a wide audience. And I really try to take the reader um, along with me for what has been an exhausting four years around <laughs> the world, around, across 300,000 miles, which is how far I traveled with Hillary Clinton. Uh, she traveled almost uh, a million miles to more countries than any of her predecessors, and she is, of course, the central character, and a very compelling one, whether you like her or not, a very compelling character uh, in this book. And I try to paint a portrait of the woman. Uh, you know, much has been written about her already. I didn't want to write a pure biography of her. It's been, it's been done before, and it will no doubt be done by great American writers. Uh, I wanted to write a first draft of history of her tenure as Secretary of State uh, to tell that story, that bigger story of American power. Now, several of my you know, I have several big takeaways, and I'm happy to answer questions about specific policy issues. But several of my big takeaways when it comes to her and her approach to uh, foreign policy and her job uh, as Secretary of State are, are as follows. She set out to improve perceptions of the US um, around the world when she and President Obama came into power in, in 2009 and started their administration. Now, I know that it doesn't always you know, go down well with an audience at home to say that you know, perceptions of American power, of, of America, had to be improved. Um, you know, people bristle sometimes at the, at the thought or the suggestion that America's image isn't perfect. I understand that people are obviously very proud of their own country. Um, but I think that everybody can agree that during the Bush administration, it wasn't exactly the golden age of diplomacy. It was a different approach to dealing with the outside world, and it didn't go down well, and it didn't necessarily do much for America's credibility. So there was very much a sense within the Obama administration that that had to be tackled, and it was a first priority. You know, before they could get down to business, before they could actually um, get anything done that was tangible, they had to uh, make it desirable, again, for countries around the world to work with America, including allies. Uh, you know, across the Atlantic. You know, the reconciliation with Europe uh, started again towards the end of the Bush administration, uh, but it still needed a lot of work. Um, Asia felt uh, abandoned and, and, and disregarded by the Bush administration, um, you know, and let's not even go to, to the Arab world, but we'll go into um, Arab perceptions of the U.S. a little bit um, later on because it does ebb and flow. When it comes to improving perceptions of the US, that was, as I said, the priority uh, for Clinton and President Obama. And she set out to, uh, can, you know, she set out on a new campaign uh, around the world, this time a campaign for America, trying to reconnect with allies and rivals everywhere, 
trying to establish new ways of working with rising powers, be they Turkey or India or even Brazil, uh, and of course, you know, the big ones like China. Um, and, you know, there have been some successes and uh, some failures. You know, the reset with Russia isn't exa exactly perfect, but again, keep in mind, other countries have their own agendas, their own domestic constituency, and it's not because uh, America wants something that it necessarily happens. Uh, and that is something that is often forgotten, and which I found that Clinton had a particular appreciation for. She had a lot of empathy, and she was able to understand where her counterparts were coming from, what they had been through, what their political agenda might be, and how she might be able to get through to them. So her diplomacy was both behind closed doors and very public. And I'll start with the public diplomacy, which is her campaign for America, which yielded two results. Uh, the first one, very briefly, is that she restored her own political fortunes. Uh, by engaging with the world, by her relentless public diplomacy, by the way she showed loyalty to the president, by being a team player, uh, by remaining above the fray of domestic U.S. politics, she has very clearly emerged as a winner. It was a gamble for both President Obama and Hillary Clinton to work together. They decided to take that risk, and I think that by all accounts, um, it was a success. You know, we'll hear perhaps further down the line uh, how much uh, division there really was, how, mu how often they really disagreed. You know, I tell some of that in, uh, in the book. Um, but overall, there was a sense of, of loyalty and a desire to show uh, un unity for the outside world, no matter how many divisions there were behind closed doors, because there was also a sense uh, that it was important to show that unity to help shore up America's credibility. They didn't want any of the public sniping uh, that happened between cabinet members during the Bush administration. So her very public position, her global stature, uh, also helped to uh, improve perceptions of the United States. You know, there was a reason why President Obama chose her. Um, it was a surprise to a lot of people. It was a surprise to her. Uh, but in hindsight, it certainly made sense. She was one of the uh, people who could get on a plane, uh, travel to any capital, and get the gr and um, 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 just get started and immediately hit the ground running with what she was trying to do. Um, and I also think, just another point, that we forget sometimes uh, the position that the U.S. was in. It wasn't just coming after eight years of the Bush administration and um, a very um, you know, bullish type of diplomacy, but it was also at the time of the, of the financial crisis, and there was a lot of talk about American decline. So again, reinforcing the need to uh, take her campaign for America around the world and really reassert American presence, American leadership, even if it's just a perception, um, you know, as, as we often... Uh, say the old adage of, uh, you know, showing up is, um, is half the battle won. Well, she certainly uh, believed in that. Her public diplomacy, uh, I think, is one of the underreported and underrated aspect of her legacy. I think it goes a long way to reach out to people directly uh, around the world because decisions and countries' futures aren't just made and decided by world leaders anymore, by those countries... Uh, leaders, but also increasingly by people. And there was a real recognition uh, within Clinton's team, but also within the Obama administration as a whole, uh, that this was something that they had to recognize and that people had to be empowered. Um, and we saw that with, with President Obama's speech um, in Israel, I think, very clearly today, continuing um, that tradition now of reaching out directly to the public, appealing to the Israeli and to the Palestinian publics to say, you know, talking above the head of, of their leaders and reaching out to them and saying, you know, if you want change, you have to help bring it about. Um, and it is about increasingly uh, empowering people. Uh, we've seen that, of course, in, in Egypt and across the Arab world. But she really tried to take that to every country that she went to. Uh, and one of my favorite examples is Pakistan. You know, it's easy to go to South Korea or to Europe um, or to um, even China, where she was seen as a, as a celebrity, um, and, you know, get the adulation of the crowd. Uh, it's quite something else to go to Pakistan and subject yourself to uh, three days of interviews and town hall meetings and a barrage of hostile questions. But she very clearly decided that she didn't want to give up on engaging with people. Um, that it was important to reach out directly to them. 
uh, make them feel that they were being listened to, that they were being respected, and that they had a stake in the say, uh, or they had a stake in their country and a say um, in, how it was, um, in how it was run. Um, and it was interesting to see how perceptions uh, changed over the course of her first trip there in 2009, and how coverage in the media also improved, ever so slightly, but you know, it's one inch at a time. Um, and you could tell that um, you know, she had helped diffuse a little bit the tension at the heart of the relationship. Now, I'm not saying that the relationship is perfect. Um, it is still very tense and, you know, so much about it as well. Uh, but I was struck by the fact that when I interviewed the Pakistani foreign minister, who's, you know, quite a feisty speaker, Hina Rabani Khar, uh, at the end of Clinton's tenure, I asked her for her take on uh, Clinton's diplomacy. And I was expecting, you know, a very harsh... Uh, position, a very uh, critical um, take on, on American policy, American diplomacy, and, and Clinton herself, because these two women certainly clashed a lot in some of their meetings. And I was surprised to hear um, Hina Rabani Carr saying that she was impressed by the empathy and the humanity that Clinton brought to every meeting, and her desire to understand where Pakistan was and what the two countries could do together to move forward. Um, and one of the crises that was diffused in, in, in that manner was in the aftermath of the Salala incident when um, I believe 24 uh, Pakistani soldiers were killed in a NATO strike. There was a real desire within Pakistan to get an apology from the United States, but it was already election season in the US, it was starting, and it was simply unfathomable for the White House to come out with an apology. Um, and it took a lot of work uh, for Hillary Clinton to try to convince people within the administration that something had to be done, that it had to be wor worded in some sort of way that would be acceptable, ac acceptable to the Pakistanis, or it would simply be impossible to move forward on issues like supply routes uh, for NATO troops in Afghanistan, or the whole discussion about the drawdown and uh, peace talks with the, pal with the, with the, with the Taliban. Eventually, uh, that apology, very carefully worded, did come. Um, and I think that that's why Hina Rabani Carr uh, was so impressed with Clinton's ability to figure out, okay, how do we work together towards a common goal? Now, when it comes to public perceptions of the U.S. around the world, I'm fully aware that, you know, the United States as a superpower uh, will probably remain loved and resented in equal measures. It is the fate of a superpower. Uh, whether you're the U.S. or China or Brazil, people in your immediate backyard, or if you're the US on a more global level, will push back against American influence. And I'm also aware um, that even though initially the polls when President Obama was elected um, showed that there was uh, better approval, more approval of the US uh, role around the world, that those polls are slipping again. They're still higher than during the Bush administration. I'm not a huge fan of polls. I think. Um, you know, to determine what a global audience thinks of a specific policy or a specific country. It's not always the full picture. Um, but I do feel that there is less animosity uh, towards the United States and that it has become desirable again to work uh, with the U.S. Whether you're an entrepreneur um, in the Arab world, whether you're uh, the French president, whether you are uh, the Turkish prime minister, um, or, or, uh, or foreign minister, um, there is that desire to do business again with the U.S., if only because of the realization uh, that the U.S. actually isn't exactly um, about to disappear from the global stage. I mean, <laughs> decline um, is, is a relative term. Um, I don't fully subscribe to it. I don't like to use that word. Uh, but power is changing. Uh, and the way the U.S. exercises American leadership has to change to catch up with that changing reality on the ground. Um, it isn't any more about you're with us or you're against us, but how can, we, how can you help us help you? How can we work towards a common goal together? Uh, it isn't always going to work, and there are people who are not going to work, want to work with the United States, but it's certainly a more collaborative approach that is being tested. The jury is still out on whether it will work, and who knows what events will, will bring our way. Uh, but it is certainly something that uh, the Obama administration tried to implement to harness the changes around the world and the rising powers around the world and try to figure out how can we work towards common goals. Sounds perhaps a little bit idealistic, but it is also very pragmatic. And that takes me to um, the other aspect of Clinton's um, legacy, 
which is to try to implement the approach to smart power. It's not a new concept. Um, you know, the Marshall Plan was in its way informally a very smart power approach to um, the, transatlantic, the transatlantic relationship. Um, but I found that Clinton tried to implement it more methodically than had been done before because both she and President Obama realized that they had to catch up with, uh, with, with the times that they were living in, um, that they had to acknowledge that countries like Turkey or India or South Africa had to be brought on board. So how do you develop the tools for 21st century diplomacy? Uh, you do that by finding those uh, common goals, by setting up um, you know, what sounds like a very boring concept, but the uh, you know, strategic and economic dialogues that the US has with China or now also uh, with some of the rising powers. And you try to get people on board so that they have a stake um, in working towards that, um, that common goal. Um, and so my um, sort of evaluation is that to judge the, um, the work of a Secretary of State and the success of a Secretary of State is that the old scorecard of how many peace agreements have you signed, how many treaties have you, um, have, you have you reached, how many agreements um, have, you, have you been able to, to get to with um, some of your partners around the world, isn't enough anymore to judge uh, the scope of American power and to um, tell us exactly whether the U.S. Is, is up or down and how well it's doing um, in its global uh, leadership. A lot has been written about the diffusion of power, uh, the end of power, uh, the G0 world, um, as Ian Bremmer calls it, the end of power, um, as Moises Nain describes it in his own book. It is becoming more difficult to uh, hold on to power, to wield it, to exercise it. And so I found that both President Obama and Hillary Clinton um, we're in a way quite avant-garde. And I'm not quite sure that either people um, in the US or even around the world are fully um, catching on to, to that reality. I mean, if you see um, the kinds of requests that still come uh, America's way for help on this issue or that issue, um, it is still um, a little bit you know, the traditional approach to you know, what can you do to, to help us. Overall, um, and I'll, I'll go into some of the, the specifics. I found that Hillary Clinton was interested in the big picture um, of how do you reposition the US for the 21st century? How do you develop those 21st century uh, statecraft tools, whether it's economic statecraft or women's issues, which you know, were very much at the center um, of her job as Secretary of State, making it very much part of the mainstream uh, conversation Sorry. with leaders everywhere. Um, she was interested, of course, in uh, improving perceptions of the United States. And she was, of course, interested as well in some of the details of, of the policy, uh, whether it was diffusing crises or uh, keeping up with events around the Arab world um, or rebalancing America's position uh, in, in Asia. Um, on the Middle East, I think that is one of the big biggest criticism that she faces, that she didn't uh, go all in. She didn't try to really uh, bang heads together. Uh, in the Arab world. Would it have made a difference? It's, it's hard to tell. Um, you know, you often um, hear that the parties have to want it on the ground. Some people will tell you, well, America has to want it more and just impose it on them. But there was a sense that, you know, the ground simply wasn't ready. But I also find that as a politician, she simply um, wasn't ready to stake her reputation uh, as a politician on what is really a thankless task. Uh, we see now that John Kerry is, is very much interested in trying to tackle that. Um, expectations have not been raised the way they were raised during President Obama's first term, which led to so much disappointment because when the U.S. doesn't deliver, you know, people throw their hands up in the air and they say, you've abandoned us. And so going back to the public diplomacy aspect of her, um, of her tenure, I found it interesting to what extent she tried to break down the talking points in ways that were very accessible to people and be quite honest and candid about how much America could do and how much it couldn't do. It's a double-edged sword. It didn't always serve her right, but certainly as someone interviewing her and as someone who grew up on the receiving end of, of decisions made in, in, um, in Washington, I found um, that it was quite refreshing to have an American official say, you know, it, it'd be great if we could just stand here and say, yes, let's, you know, let's go bring down Assad. Uh, but if we don't have what it takes to do it, uh, we would be um, dishonest. We wouldn't be f open to the people on the ground, um, making them believe that the cavalry is coming when it isn't coming. 
Uh, but that's a message that's very difficult for people on the ground to hear when they are being shot at, when they are feeling abandoned by the West, when they're um, you know, being uh, um, killed on a daily basis by uh, their government. Uh, obviously, it's something that is very comforting to President Assad uh, himself to know that the cavalry isn't coming. So it's very difficult to, um, to balance the public discourse and the diplomatic discourse and how much you say to the public and how much you don't say to, uh, to the public and how open you are about what the U.S. can and cannot do. Uh, you know, you can travel around the world to reassert American leadership. You, be, you can be candid um, with, um, you know, what you are uh, able to do. Uh, but you also don't want to start then feeding the perception that your power is, is very limited. So it cuts um, both ways. So where is um, the U.S. today? Uh, when, you know, you look at what Hillary Clinton has done and hasn't done, what President Obama has achieved or, um, or not achieved, you know, there are still a lot of, there's a lot of unfinished business, whether it's North Korea, whether it's uh, Iran, uh, whether it is the Middle East peace process. Um, I, ans I asked that question to, to, to Clinton herself. I said, look, you know, what, what have you really achieved? Some of your critics say um, that you know, you've been inconsequential um, as a Secretary of State. Um, and she said, you know, it's about the big picture. It's about making it possible to move forward now. It's about laying the foundation. Uh, for a new way of uh, exercising global leadership. And perhaps now we'll be able to see, um, you know, in the second term of the administration, in the second term of President Obama, uh, whether, you know, it'll be possible to pick some uh, low-hanging fruit. Uh, but there is this constant, um, you know, back and forth in what the world wants from the United States and how much it wants the U.S. to um, get involved or, or not, how much it wants the U.S. to interfere and how much it doesn't. And you know, when I talk to audiences uh, abroad about my book, I remind them that it's also about them to decide what it is that they want from America. You know, it's easy, like we were doing during the war in Lebanon, to say, you know, if the war um, is ongoing, it's because you know, America doesn't want it to end. Um, if there is chaos in Iraq in the aftermath of the Iraqi invasion, it's because it was part of the plan, uh, even though clearly there was no plan for the day after. Um, in Washington. And so we have a tendency abroad to, um, you know, overestimate a, America's uh, ability to move things. I don't want to underestimate it either, but I think it's important for people to understand also what it is that they want from the United States. I was very struck during the Egypt Revolution by something that an American official uh, told me. Um, you know, People in Egypt were waiting every day to see what President Obama was going to say um, about whether Hosni Mubarak should step down or not. And my sense here was that the administration was waiting to see you know, what the Egyptian street was going to say because they didn't want to be leading the charge and then finding out that they had pushed people all the way forward um, and that there was going to be a violent crackdown and the US wasn't you know, going to be willing or ready to actually do anything to intervene on the ground. So they were waiting to listen to the people and seeing how far the people actually wanted to go. And I really found that it was a, you know, a back and forth. It ebbed and it flowed. Uh, but there were always calls for the U.S. to do more and to be more open and more forcefully and more quickly call for uh, President Hosni Mubarak's uh, departure. And so this American official tells me this is the irony here. On the one hand, we're being accused of dominating everything and dictating everything. And on the other hand, we're being accused of not di dictating everything and dominating everything. Uh, these are choices to be made by the Egyptian people. And these are questions that I still hear when I go back to um, Beirut even. Um, you know, people ask me, so what's the plan? What is America planning? Um, and they find it very hard to grasp my, my tale of watching American officials scramble to keep up with change. Again not trying to underestimate the power that the U.S. has, but it's important not to um, overestimate it um, either. And it is really, I find, at this stage, um, about making clear to people, and I found that that is something that Clinton was, was quite good at, despite all her you know, shortcomings. Um, I found that she was quite good at telling people, you know, it's up to you. you know, the U.S. can help, but we're not able to remake societies. And I found that that was also another very candid um, uh, uh, statement to make 
from an American official to acknowledge that you know mistakes had been made in foreign policy in the U.S. before, and you try to learn from them and move uh, forward. And I found it um, quite disarming, you know, when she talked to audiences um, around the world. So clearly, there's a there's a change in the tone of American uh, diplomacy. Uh, there's a desire to work with the U.S. Um, again. Um, it isn't, you know, a universal love fest, um, as I said. But what I found most interesting today, and that brings me to the question about how much involvement, how much American involvement the U.S. wants and, or how little it wants, is to compare two very different situations. But bear with me just one second. You know, when you look at the aftermath of the Iraq war, um, you know, by all accounts, um, you know, whatever word you want to use, debacle, disaster, um, fiasco, fiasco, or if you want to be, you know, more generous, uh, you'll say it didn't go according to plan. Um, and there was real resentment uh, in the Arab world uh, about, you know, an American invasion, which initially was meant to, you know, uh, liberate the people from um, the dictatorship. And there were thanks from the Shia community. There was also a lot of bloodletting and a lot of chaos. And Resentment against the United States really boiled over during that period. Even though, you know, as a reporter in the Arab world during that time, I often heard people say that they were uh, pleased that it had happened. They would never say that publicly. Uh, they were glad Saddam was gone. Uh, they were hoping that perhaps it might stir desire for change in countries like Saudi Arabia and, um, and Syria. But very quickly, they looked at the chaos in Iraq and they thought, no, thank you. You know, we, we don't want this. Um, and of course, you know, in the 10 years since, um, you know, nobody looks at Iraq and thinks, you know, we want a repeat of that, especially not, uh, as far as I can tell, in this country. But what I found very interesting is that despite the debacle or the fiasco of, of Iraq and the very clear anger about a U.S. military intervention um, in a Muslim country, you see now that people are wondering why the U.S. isn't helping the violence end in Syria. Bear with me just one more second, because I know these are incomparable for many reasons. Iraq was a unilateral decision with a coalition of, of the willing. It was done on you know, a flawed intelligence or false pretenses, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but it was America intervening. Um, and it was, you know, as we've all been saying, um, a fiasco. So why is it that despite uh, that fiasco, uh, you find that in the Arab world 10 years later, people are suddenly looking to the U.S. and saying, why aren't you doing anything about the violence in Syria? Um, and it's that difference, that nuance between, you know, when America goes it alone and when it goes into a situation like Libya, for example, where it is called on to help, where, the, where other countries come on board, like the French and the British, and where the Arabs are also uh, on board, and they put their mouth where their money is, because we saw uh, the Emiratis and the Qataris uh, participate militarily um, in that intervention. And so there is, a, there is a nuance there that I find is often lost in, in, um, in the discourse in the US when they look at the Arab world. Because it isn't just you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's really about how you do it. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind when we listen to uh, the calls for help from Syria. I'm not advocating intervention or no intervention. I think it's a very complicated situation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about it. I reported on Syria extensively. I am myself, as a person, very torn about what the best option is for, for Syria. Uh, but I do find it genuinely intriguing that people in the Arab world are willing not all of them, of course, but a lot of them are willing to put aside uh, the debacle of an American intervention in Iraq um, and think, OK, you know, wh what can you do to help us with, um, with Syria? And that goes back to my point about uh, the role and the changing role uh, of American power. We saw the downside of too much power, of hubris. Um, but now I wonder whether we're seeing the downside of too little power or perhaps more accurately, uh, the reluctance uh, to use it. Um, and with that, um, I will end my, my talk and take some of your questions.
Thank you, Kim. That was a very stimulating uh, set of uh, observations. Let me return to the, uh, the incident where the 24 Pakistani soldiers were killed because in a way this is a um, very emblematic of a lot of things that happened between the Obama White House and Hillary Clinton's State Department. And if you look at Vali Nasser's uh, piece in Foreign Policy and his forthcoming book, I mean, he basically says three things that, that this, and, and this incident particularly underlines. This, this was a White House that really only cared about domestic politics. This is a White House that didn't really care about diplomacy. This was a White House that made all the decisions. And the reason that this, the deaths of these 24 Pakistani soldiers and the fact that it took nine months for apology eventually to come out of Hillary Clinton's mouth was because of these three reasons. Domestic politics, it was an election season. They didn't care about diplomacy. They didn't really care about trying to make nice with the Pakistanis. They really only cared about counterterrorism. And finally, it was always a White House decision. So, you know, do you think Valley Nasser's sort of overall kind of take uh, is correct? That, you know, the State Department was sort of marginalized on most issues. And then, you know, a, a sub part of that, of course, was, you know, Holbrook never got to meet with the president one on one. And Holbrook, of course, was Clinton's person. And uh, despite the fact this was supposedly the president's most important uh, foreign policy uh, kind of mission at the time, which was sorting out the Afghan war. So what do you think of Valley's insider perspective? And you, you quote him in the book fairly extensively. Um, I also quote him saying um, that for his first time in, in government, he looked at how hard it was to get anything done. And he said, um, you know, I will, I, I, I can find the exact quote. He says, you know, um, I'll never again say, you know, you should have done this or you should have done that because he suddenly realizes how actually difficult um, it really is. I don't think that um, Vali and I um, disagree on, on very much. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we disagree about Clinton's role within the administration. Um, I'm always interested in the nuances um, of, of, of every discussion. That's also what I try to do uh, with, with my book, is to bring nuance to discussion about American power, uh, to bring nuance to the discussion about how the rest of the world perceives um, the US. I think every White House uh, always has the final say mm -hmm. on policy, on foreign policy. I mean, I'm not a Washington insider. I've only been here for five years. but. You know, that's very much my perception. That's very much, very much my understanding. You have some secretaries of state who are more powerful than others. Um, but even someone like Condoleezza Rice, who was national security advisor to the president, who then became secretary of state, was often on the losing end of, of arguments uh, about what was the best course of action to take within the administration. Um, it was for different reasons. You know, within the White House of President Bush, sometimes I think it was more ideologically driven. The, discourse, the, the, the arguments were more ideologically driven. I do think, yes, that this White House is much, it's quite political. Uh, but I, I tell the story of um, President uh, Truman, uh, you know, back in the day when he has to make a decision about whether to uh, recognize the state of Israel or, or not. And the State Department is furious about the possibility that this might happen. They first want to make sure that they, you know, don't alienate the Arabs. And, you know, the president's um, uh, political advisor within the White House uh, turns to you know the State Department officials and says, "Look, you don't understand here. The president has to get reelected. That's all that matters." Um, and it is very often a recurring mm. theme, and it is something that we don't often that, that we sometimes forget abroad as well. And I think it's important to remember that. I can't speak for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed her a lot. I interviewed her 19 times. Mm. She never gave me the impression that she felt marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, and I. I you know, it's hard to see someone like Hillary Clinton actually being marginalized. She isn't someone who you, know, you can just put to the side. I think she chose her battles very carefully. I think she weighed very heavily on a lot of issues. Uh, she won some battles and not others. You know, both Gates and her were, if I'm not mistaken, on the losing end of the argument for uh, even a, an even bigger number of troops for the surge. Right. Um, <coughs> So she lost that, you know. She tried to engage with uh, Hamid Karzai. Uh, you know, she was able to do that with a lot of leaders, but she failed with Hamid Karzai. It didn't really go um, anywhere. Uh, Holbrook didn't get one-on-one -on -one meetings with, uh, with the president, but she got one every week. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was one of the conditions, if, I'm not, uh, if, if, if I understand correctly, that was one of her conditions for taking the job. She wanted to be able to go uh, um, above 
the, the bureaucracy, the machinery around the president mm. to have direct access uh, to him. I do think that, yes, politics are you know, always involved in, in every decision that you make. But that goes back to my point about loyalty. You know, Clinton never in public, not to journalists, not to her uh, foreign counterparts, uh, none of her aides ever showed that, that there was dissension uh, within the administration. You know, history will, will tell. You know, we'll find out in a few years, you know, like I said, how much agreement or how much division there was and how bitter the fighting actually was. But what I found her approach was often, and I detail that on, in the Libya chapter, is to get a good sense of the situation on the ground, figure out what it was she thought was the best course of action, and then give the president the elements that he needed to come to the same conclusion as her. Mm. And sometimes that works and sometimes um, that doesn't. Th that doesn't. In, in, on the Libya case, uh, she gathered all the elements that were needed to tip the balance in favor of military intervention and a UN resolution that called for all necessary measures to uh, protect civilians. You know, on Pakistan, um, you know, it, it took a lot of time and it was partly because of, of the politics. It's also partly because of the Pakistanis and how how they put the bar and exactly what kind of apology they want and you know it's not always easy um, to get that uh, to get that going mm -hmm. uh, but it was an effort that she um, you know pursued relentlessly because she realized that it, it had to be done one of the things that comes across really clearly in your book is the incredible grind that sec the secretary had to do her job and her staff and also you covering her uh, and the other thing that comes through very clearly is what you mentioned the empathy and but to get one thing that surprised me was how late everything ran all the time because I think of she became of, better over the course of but um, she the be, years. It, everything ran late because she would be basically listen to everybody had what they had to say wouldn't wrap it up and say we have to move to the next meeting uh, so she was uh, and and then you contrast it in a sense with President Obama there's a great scene in a book where President Obama goes into a meeting with King Abdullah and doesn't really do any pleasantries and basically says um, why don't you give Al Al overflight rights and King Abdullah says whoever suggested this talking point wants to destroy our relationship uh, you know so clearly a very a kind of very different approach um, do you think consistently they were you know President Obama's had a different approach in these kinds of meetings versus Hillary Clinton based on your own reporting you know obviously my focus in the reporting and in the book is on um, Hillary Clinton and I yeah. haven't been in many of the meetings um, with the president I mean I haven't you know um, <coughs> I, I'm not sure many people have been in meetings with the president, um, uh, but it's not the focus of my reporting. But they clearly have very different styles. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it also comes with experience and age. Um, mm -hmm. I think she has matured and evolved in her style. I think that um, removed from you know the fray of domestic politics, she was able to be more herself, um, to tap into that ability of hers to empathize with people and put it to work uh, in her conversations. Um, and it is something that world leaders also commented on. Uh, you know, I interviewed several foreign uh, officials for the book and they often volunteered that um, observation about her ability to talk to them as, as a mother, as a friend, uh, before getting down to business, or simply to understand you know, what it was that they could both do to, to bridge the gap. I mean, think about um, you know, what we're seeing today with the apology that Benjamin Netanyahu has finally given to the Turks about the Mavi Marmara mm. incident. It's taken almost two, two and a half years. Right. Um, and it's not for the lack of trying. I mean, Clinton tried, President Obama tried. I mean, President Obama has good relations with several world leaders, but it's not a chummy kind of relationship. It's just not the kind of guy he, he is. I mean, you can criticize him for him or criticizing for it or not, but it's just not the personality that, that he has, that he brings to the job. Um, but that apology reminded me of, uh, you know, the incident itself. Um, mm back in, uh, was it 2010, uh, May, May or June 2010, the end of May 2010. You know, Davut Tolu was, um, the day after, was meant to be in Washington for talks about the Iran sanctions. And he had a morning meeting to prepare for his meeting with Hillary Clinton. Uh, and the officials who came to see him 
were focused on the Iran sanctions. And Davutoglu was, you know, what, what is wrong with you people? You know, we've, we've had, you know, Turkish citizens detained, killed, you know, there's this incident happening, you know, it's, a, it's an affront to Turkish sovereignty, and you're here to talk to me about Iran sanctions? Um, then he goes into his meeting with Hillary Clinton, and the first thing she says is, I'm, you know, my condolences, and mm. I'm, I'm sorry for, for, for what happened. And she personally picks up the phone and calls, um, you know, the Israeli prime minister to sort out, you know, releasing one of the, I think one of the journalists who was, um, who was, uh, who was detained, who hadn't been, who, who was uh, missing. I can't remember the exact details. And suddenly Davutoglu, you know, the tension just leaves the room and he, you know, he's sitting with someone who understands that, you know, uh, what he's going through and who tells him that as a mother she can't imagine that someone wouldn't know where their child was. Um, you know, is it something that women bring to the job? Possibly. Um, you know, not all women either. So it, it, it really um, depends. But I think that what we saw in President Obama's speech, just to come back to your question, what we saw with President Obama's speech uh, in, in, in Jerusalem wasn't just in his own attempt at public diplomacy, but his own um, ability as well to empathize mm. uh, or to show empathy uh, with the people who are on both sides of that conflict, whether it's the Palestinians or um, or the Israelis. You know, comparing um, you know Palestinian children to his own daughters and saying you know everybody would want the best for their kids. And I mean, it is it does go a long way. I think it's you know you can roll your eyes and say it's all that soft power is is nice, uh, but it does seem to get you somewhere um, sometimes. In your book, you, um, you have a lot of characters that are probably not well known to the American public who are, are not part of the kind of conventional State Department apparatus in a sense, Huma Aberdeen, uh, Jake Sullivan, Philip Reince. Um, you know, who are these people and what role do they play for Hillary Clinton? And, 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 as a sort of, and do these people all expect to be part of the 2016 campaign that surely is coming? <laughs> So you say. <laughs> well, and what is, what's, your, what's your answer? Um, you know, they're very different characters. Yeah. Uh, because Philippe Reigns and uh, Huma Abedin are part of, you know, if you want to call it Hillary land, you know, Huma Abedin has been with Clinton since the 90s in the White House. Philippe joined her in the Senate. They were both part of the campaign trail. Um, so they're very much part of the Hillary machine. You know, they were there to make sure that she looked good, that she had everything she wanted, very careful about her image. Um, and you know, you would think that they were sort of quite successful. Um, you know, I don't know whether uh, restoring her uh, image was always part of the plan, or whether it was just an unintended positive uh, result of mm. her doing her job well. Uh, but certainly between Huma and Philippe, there was a lot of attention being paid to how she came across, to how events were staged, to, uh, you know, more so even than the usual attention that is brought to events staged for a Secretary of State, you know, uh, profiles in magazines, access to reporters writing uh, long-form long articles about her, documentaries. Um, you know, there was some criticism of, of that approach uh, in the State Department, people saying, you know, are, are we here to serve, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton or are we here to serve the Secretary of State? Uh, but I found that over the course of the for years, some of those same people then told me, well, you know what, in the end, it serves America's image, so why not? I mean, because on the world stage, she, she's, of course, Hillary Clinton, the former first lady, the former senator, but she represents America. Mm. Um, so they will, if she um, decides to run, and um, I'm happy to discuss that. I mean, I th think I can give you a sense of what might be going through her mind, or, or as an observer, what I think will. Um, well, what, it, what is will, that? Well, I think she's a very flexible and pragmatic person. I think that she's going to make sure that she doesn't do anything to undermine her chances of running if she decides to do so. I think the pull will be very strong, um, but I really don't think that she has made up her mind fully. I think that between her health, her age, um, her family, you know, Bill and, and Chelsea and whatever may be going on in their lives, uh, who might be her opponent in the Republican Party. 
uh, who might be her opponent in the Democratic Party? I mean, in 2007, everybody said she was a shoo-in and the Democratic nomination was, her for, for, was hers for the taking. It didn't, it didn't turn out like that. You know, I'm not an expert at American domestic politics, but you know, um, perhaps it is still possible that someone uh, might you know, rush her to the finish line. I think it's unlikely, um, but you, know, uh, you can never quite tell. Uh, she'll have to make a decision sometime in the next year uh, whether she wants to do that or not. I think that her uh, video uh, coming out in f support of um, uh, gay marriage was seen as um, her first mm. opening, her first public statement that you know sort of unofficially launched that campaign. I'm, you know, I looked at the video. I certainly thought, okay, this is. You know, this very much looks like a campaign um, video without her saying it. But I was very interested in the, you know, I compared it to her um, video announcing her start of the campaign in 2008 or 2007. You know, very different lighting, very different hairstyle, much softer. You know, this is something that she wasn't comfortable putting forward as a candidate in 2008, her sort of softer side. And, you know, she told me herself that, you know, uh, since 2008, what she's learned as Secretary of State is to, be better at connecting uh, with people, um, but whatever she decides, you know, it's not the last that we've we've heard of her. She's not just going to retire into the background. Uh, so whether it's a presidential campaign or whether it's something else, um, you know, um, she she will still be quite prominent. But Jake Sullivan is in a different category uh, because he's very much um, a foreign policy uh, operative. He's now um, the national security advisor to uh, the vice president. Um, he became very prominent uh, at the State Department as an aide to, to Clinton on all things uh, foreign policy. You know, I tell the story of how you know, she calls him at you know, all hours of the day to say you know, what's going on in the world because he helps her to keep track of all the details. I mean, she, she's very good at keeping track of the details, but she tries to keep focused on the big picture. And you need someone to constantly tell you, you, know, behind, you know, beyond the, the, the headlines, you know, these are the trend lines or you know, this is how these things are. Um, are connected. If she decides to run, I have no doubt that um, at least Huma and, and Philippe and possibly all of them uh, will be um, involved um, in, in, in one way or, or another. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to include them in the book and many others, because there are a lot of you know, um, characters in the book, is to really show um, you know, the human beings at the heart of the foreign policy machine, the fallible human beings who don't have all the answers, who are sleep deprived, who mm. don't have all the facts, who are doing the best they can, whether you agree with their decisions or, um, or not. So, you know, there are lots of characters in there, small and, and, and big, you know, foreign service officers and, you know, Pakistani guards, just sort of humanize um, all of that a little bit. You've got a busy day job, so how did you write the book? Oh my goodness. Um, I put my social life on hold. <laughs> uh, I told my friends I'd see them in two years. <laughs> and uh, they were very forgiving. And um, you, very also, you must have kept good notes, because I mean, you really have very detailed accounts of some. You know, I, I don't know whether I should say this in public, but I'm a terrible note taker. I'm a terrible note taker, and I have a, a, a real sort of strong innate resistance to keeping a diary. I cannot do it. It is something about maybe growing up in Lebanon where you know, we're all about forgetting the past and moving forward. Mm. We have collective amnesia about the war. I don't want anything in writing about what I went through. Um, you know, retelling some of those experiences in the book it was really the first time that I wrote about it. It was mm. very, very, very painful, um, but I'm glad, um, I'm glad I did it. I have a very good visual memory. I have a very good emotional memory. I remember how things felt, um, mm. how tired I, I was, how nauseous I was from the curry or the jet lag. Um, but I also did a lot of research in the mm. local media. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I had all my notes or, or all my reporting you know, from television and, uh, and, and from radio that are preserved on, uh, in the BBC archive. And I went back to some of this. Because sometimes you notice things when you listen back to an interview or mm. listen back to footage that you hadn't noticed uh, in the moment. But you kept your day job while you were I writing? kept my day job, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I kept my day job because it was very much, you know, I had to be in the moment to continue witnessing um, history in the making. And so then I went back, um, it was, it was I, I felt sometimes like I was, you know, it was an out-of-body experience because I was reporting on the day-to-day -day news, but I was also then going home and taking a you know, trip down memory lane to the first trip, the second trip, interviewing people, 
Um, and I did a lot of interviews to piece together some of those moments that I didn't have access to. I mean, I wasn't in the room when Clinton talks to Davutoglu um, about um, the, um, the, the, the agreement that they're trying to reach with the Iranians. But I spoke to people who were in the room. And I try to piece all those moments together. You know, the conversation that President, uh, President Obama had with Hosni Mubarak, telling him, you know, this, these reforms that you're offering is just not, not enough. It's, you know, not going to work. On that issue, do you think Clinton was, uh, was, was Obama ahead of Clinton in terms of pushing Mubarak out the door? I think it's hard to tell. I think it's hard to tell. I think there was an instinct to want to be with the people, mm -hmm. um, to want to recognize that a desire for, for change and to support it. Because there was a sense that perhaps they had let down the Iranians in, in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, very different situations. Mm -hmm. um, but that they couldn't let that moment be a missed opportunity for, for the US. They recognized that something big was was happening. You know, they'd just seen Zinedine Ben Ali uh, being deposed in, in Tunisia. Clinton and Gates were definitely more tempered in their enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. If only because, you know, age, experience, um, right. you know, years in, 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 in American government and, 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 and policy recognizing um, this was an ally of 30 years. I mean, she made that comment about Egypt being stable on, on January 25th, and she got a lot of criticism for it. But it was just an expression of, you know, 30 years of American policy towards Egypt that you can't just, you know, switch off within seconds as the revolution is just getting underway in, um, in Egypt. And there was also a realization that if you immediately said, well, you know, millions of people are taken to the streets in, in Egypt, um, fine, you know, we'll put Mubarak to the side. Uh, you know, these were still very early days, and I'm not quite sure that we'd reached the million mark yet. You know, it was just starting in those first um, week, in that first week. You know, there was a realization with uh, Mubarak and, um, and uh, sorry, with Gates and Clinton, um, that they had to be careful about how America looked to its other uh, allies and friends. I mean, if you know the Saudis and the Pakistanis would would say, well, you know, the minute there are demonstrations in our country, you're going to throw us under the bus. You know, America is already being accused and criticized for being a fickle friend. You know, how fickle are you really? And so that goes back to the point that I was making about trying to really stay in tune with the Egyptian street, because there was one speech that President Mubarak made, which seemed to temper. Uh, the mood on on uh, on the streets, and which um, made s many Egyptians think, okay, you know, maybe maybe this is enough for now. And then the next day, you had the episode um, with the horses and the camels on the streets, mm. and the protesters uh, being beaten and, and killed, and violence erupting again. And then all bets were off again. And that's when you know the the administration became much more forceful in public, watching what was going on on the street in Egypt became much more forceful here in Washington saying, okay, you know, this is, you know, this isn't working. Um, so it was very much trying to stay in tune with the Egyptian public. Pivot to Asia is one of the big sort of um, signature supposed changes in the Obama administration. And um, Burma seems to be a sort of unalloyed success, basically. Um, They're having their own issues but internally. As to the extent that you can, because I mean, one of the problems is you laid out it's hard to sort of score this, you know, where where you're making it's 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 hard, you know, if you don't have some sort of treaty or some kind of, but Burma looks like it's it's only better to be Burmese today than it was five years ago, right? So, yeah. but it's uh, also a decision made within Burma, right? But it seems that the Clinton minister, the, uh, the uh, Obama administration, we're not there yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> or we were there. We were there. <laughs> um, it seems that. It seems that they managed this one pretty well. In the same way, let's say that George H. W. Bush managed the kind of fall of the Berlin Wall pretty yeah, well. I and mean, the Gulf so War. yeah. So you can yeah, you can you can you can manage these things in a way that it doesn't could have become a you know regional crisis or whatever. And you and it seems that in Burma, this is one of it's it, of all the kind of things we that you might talk about. Mm -hmm. This seems to be the absolutely most unmitigated success. I mean, Libya may also turn out to be some, somewhat successful. And, Obviously, Syria is not a success. So how would you score uh, Burma, Libya, Syria, these kinds of? I make an, 
um, what may be a sort of strange comparison actually between Burma and Libya. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that even though the situations were very different and one you know, involved a military intervention, the approach was the same. The thinking behind the approach was the same. Mm. The local stakeholders want our help. The region is on board. Um, the people within the country want the change. How do we help choreograph this and how do we help make it happen? Right. So in Libya, you had the Arab League deciding that they wanted a no-fly zone. You had the Arabs saying, we will in, you know, get involved militarily. You had the Libyans very clearly calling uh, for help. And you had the Europeans uh, you know, desperate for um, the US to get involved somehow because they couldn't do all the heavy lifting on their own. And the US doesn't want to do all the heavy lifting on its own anyway. So it's sort of regional and local cooperation empowering the local stakeholders. And with Burma, you had a decision within Burma by the ruling, uh, by the, the, I guess you can't call them the junta anymore, but by the ruling Slok, know, or yeah, governors or whatever, hmm. uh, the president, that they wanted to open up to, um, to the outside world, that they wanted to reform. Um, that their economy wasn't going to improve unless they you know, latched on to progress in Asia. I don't know, perhaps they looked at what was happening in the Arab world and also thought, you know, if you don't reform in time, chaos engulfs mm. you. We might just as well um, you know, get on with that. But it started in 2009. The first sort of signs that Burma was willing to open up were uh, were seen in 2009 at the beginning of the president uh, the, of, of Obama's administration. And Clinton heard several Asian ministers when she was in an ASEAN meeting in Asia tell her that this was happening mm. and that there had to be a different way to engage with, with Burma and that they were willing to help and that they were willing to you know, engage the Burmese and keep the Americans up to date with what was going on and how the U.S. could help and get involved and in the end seal the deal. So you have, again, the Burmese wanting to do it, the regional players like Indonesia eager to figure out a way to help and work with the Americans to make it happen, and then the U.S. You know, um, steps in and helps to, uh, to bring it um, together. So those two uh, intervention, sort of civilian and military, are um, a success. What happens after, you know, you can't control. We saw the tragedy in, um, in Benghazi, and we see now that, you know, the path towards democracy in Burma is, is very rocky. I mean, there, it's not because suddenly you open up or suddenly you remove a dictator uh, that all your problems are, are solved. Um, in Syria, I mean, it's hard to you know, how can you call it a success when 70,000 people um, have, have died? Perhaps it's a success if you think that the U.S. should not get involved in any more wars anywhere ever again. And then, you know, you say, okay, you know, we've managed to stay out of this one. Um, Are historians going to regard this as the Rwanda of the Obama administration? I tend to shy away from making big historical comparisons uh, like these because I think only time... Uh, will tell. I don't like to make predictions, which are then you know um, contradicted by the next day's uh, events or or headlines. Um, and I always bristled at you know the foreign media making comparisons between my country and you know other countries. Um, you know, Lebanon is Lebanon. Syria is um, is is Syria. Um, I also don't think that we're necessarily. Uh, able to talk yet about a failed state. I mean, Syria has strong institutions. It has a history of civil society that people aren't necessarily aware of, that is underreported. Um, I don't know how long this conflict will go on, um, but I certainly did never expect that it would be over uh, quickly. And I fully expected Bashar al-Assad to do everything he could and use all the violence at his disposal to hold on to power. Because it's just a different approach, it's a different rationale to the idea of leadership and the idea of power that is sometimes very difficult for people in this country to, to understand uh, and in the West. Um, you know, I recount a conversation with an American official uh, you know, in the summer of 2011 already uh, in the book and I say, you know, 
President Assad is going to burn the country down before he gives it up. Mm. And the American official says, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, what good does that do anyone? And like, well, you know, it does him a lot of good because he's still in power. Um, and it is often difficult to understand, but you know, I, I lived in Lebanon for 30 years, my whole life, um, before moving to Washington. I lived under Syrian uh, occupation. Um, and that's why I, I, I think um, I still value my ability to remain an outsider, no matter how long I've, I've been in Washington, is because I still try to tap into you know, what it's like to live in the Middle East and what shapes your worldview and what shapes your understanding of what is good for you or bad for you, how America is, um, is perceived. Look, Syria is a very difficult um, situation. Um, and I can appreciate the difficulty and the agonizing decision making that is going on in, um, in the US when it comes to you know, what, what do we do. Um, but going back to your, one of your earlier questions about politics, you know, politics and the election was also very much a determining factor in President Obama deciding that he didn't want to get anywhere near that um, conundrum of, of, um, of Syria um, because he didn't want to say anything that would mean that he owned the problem and that he had to get involved when nobody really knew what the best way forward was. And is it one of Clinton's failing that she didn't tip the balance in favor of you know, um, arming the rebels? You know, possibly. Uh, but she certainly wasn't able to give the president the same kind of certitude in the elements that she was bringing him for Libya uh, on, on Syria. So she wasn't able to say, look, the Arabs are on board. They'll get involved. Uh, the French and the British are on board. I'm talking 2012. The situation has changed now. Um, you know, we have a, you know, a, um, uh, a Syrian coalition that is, you know, coalescing, that is representative. There was none of that. Uh, and so it's fine for the U.S. to say, okay, fine, you know, we'll, I don't know, we'll, we'll do it. But you need to have the elements that at least make it s slightly uh, workable. I think now the situation um, is changing um, in, on the ground in, in Syria. You have the French and the British who are much more eager to do something. You have the Arabs much more eager to arm. Um, I think we're moving towards some kind of intervention, but not a full-scale military intervention. Couldn't you have a no-fly zone that uh, you could invoke a NATO Article 5 because Syria has attacked Turkey? You could have an enforceable NATO-led no fly zone in the north of the country, for instance. You, you'd need another incident, wouldn't you? Another incident. I don't know. Where, I mean, so you use this. Where, where Syria um, attacks, attacks Turkey. I mean, that didn't happen um, last time. year when they decided to deploy the Patriots, uh, which is when they decided to, to deploy um, the Patriots. But there is a lot of talk now about how you can um, you know, either enforce a no fly zone, perhaps have strategic strikes. Uh, but you'd need a coalition of the willing um, that involves Arab right. countries. Um, you know, very often, um, and I say it, you know, candidly as somebody who grew up in the Arab world, you know, people in the Arab world uh, often want the U.S. to help, but then when it does, like I said, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I mm. think that, you know, that is perhaps slowly changing because of the Iraq-Syria situation where suddenly they realize, you know, not, you know, it's not always uh, the case that we don't want the U.S. to do to do anything. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's some introspection maybe going on there, um, but there isn't a foolproof plan. And you're dealing with uh, with a dictator who's, you know, very cunning, um, who understands how to play the region and play people against um, each other. Uh, but it is. You know, certainly uh, the case that every day that goes by that um, there isn't a solution, uh, it only gets worse. Let's throw it over into questions. Can you wait for the mic and identify yourself and uh, to this gentleman here? Thank you. It's uh, Dana Marshall, Transnational Strategy Group. Thanks very much for those comments. You mentioned uh, a little bit, but I want to draw you out a bit on um, one of the more interesting to me areas that she uh, moved policy forward, and that's in economic statecraft. <clears throat> there were, to my county, no fewer than four speeches that she gave on that subject in the United States. I think the last was in Singapore. I wonder, maybe the genesis of that, who were her outside advisors? Were there, were there people inside the building that were kind of urging her to take a more forward-leaning 
uh, position on those issues? I think it's very much uh, part of the approach of you know, smart power. Uh, what was interesting about Clinton, which again is perhaps slightly different from President Obama, is that she's very open to a lot of outside input. She wants all the briefing books, all the notes, all the books, uh, all the, um, the background information so that she can form you know, her own uh, impression, her own opinion about what may possibly be the best way forward. She's very open to outside um, input. You know, interestingly enough, I've asked several, several of her uh, advisors who was her you know, um, main inspiration or who did she read most or what articles inspired her most. They didn't seem to be able to point out to one thing um, in, in particular. And I, you know, I, I'd like to go back to them and um, ask, ask again. But it does very much seem to be a combination of a lot of different output, uh, a, lot, a lot of different input, uh, talking to a lot of her predecessors, um, former secretaries of, um, of state, um, listening to people within the building, uh, which is something that doesn't happen uh, very often with secretaries of state, depending on their style of uh, diplomacy. But realizing also the changing nature of power. Um, you know, diplomacy in the old traditional way of, 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 um, of doing it over the last you know, centuries just doesn't work anymore. It isn't just about treaties. It isn't just about war and peace. It is about uh, empowering people. It is about money. You know, very simply, it is about money. Um, it is about empowering women. Um, and she made that also part of the mainstream of, of the conversation. You know, if you want to advance um, your own country, she would tell um, leaders around the world, you know, it's not going to happen if you leave half of your economic force behind, if you leave half of the population um, behind. Um, and she made that very, I mean, she put it in very pragmatic terms. It wasn't a nice, you know, nice to have soft power um, issue. It was pragmatic. She put it in very pragmatic terms. Um, you know, if you want to improve your economy, you know, it's not going to happen if you leave half the population um, behind. So it's an interesting question, who were her, you know, main influencers or, you know, what, what main books were she, what was she reading to develop some of those ideas? I think it's, a, like I said, a combination of um, diverse outputs and a recognition that you have to uh, exercise uh, global leadership in a new, innovative way. Hi, my name is Dave Bryce, and I'm a retired area resident who gets to attend events like this, so that's very okay. nice. Uh, it's like a big campus, University <laughs> Campus <laughs> exactly. Washington, it's isn't a it? huge <laughs> campus, and free. Um, <laughs> We Thank should change you. that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I like, I like the free part. Thank you very much. Um, kind of two related questions. Uh, obviously, you know, um, although it's changing, you know, politics, uh, diplomacy, all these things, somewhat still a male-dominated world. So you have this Hillary Clinton doing it. So first of all, in the 300,000 miles that you traveled with her, d from others, did you see any reaction to her being a woman, either positively or negatively? And then kind of related, she's not just any woman, you know, she's part of the Bill Hillary team, you know, maybe the most interesting political couple since Macbeth and Lady Macbeth in terms of the way people, people relate to them, you know. And so the question is, uh, what, did that have any impact? And then kind of tangentially, did Bill have any impact on her? So there's kind of three related questions. Thanks. You know, it's a question that I have been getting a lot um, about her as a woman and how I interacted with her as a woman. Um, and to be honest, it's taken me by surprise because it's not something that I think of often uh, myself. Um, I don't know if that term exists, but I find that mostly I'm gender blind. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up as an Arab woman with a father who never, ever said anything to me about not being able to do something because I was a woman. So it's, it's not something that is a natural starting point for any discussion or, or thinking um, that I do. That's not to say that you know, Arab women don't, have, uh, don't face you know, an uphill struggle, uh, but we also have a lot of very strong Arab women who are very assertive and 
um, you know, run a lot of businesses and own a lot of uh, capital in the Arab world. Um, so in my writing about Hillary Clinton, obviously I'm aware she's a woman, uh, and I'm where I'm a woman, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't something that I focused on to explain her approach to work. Because I covered another Secretary of State who was also a woman, Condoleezza Rice, who was very different in her style, very different. What was the big difference? Clinton is warmer, um, not just in her interactions with um, you know, average citizens, but also in her interactions with leaders. Uh, and that is something that some of her foreign counterparts commented on. Uh, not in saying a woman, but contrasting Clinton and Dr. Rice, saying, you know, Dr. Rice, you know, we loved her, she was great, you know, she, she was, you know, respected and admired by many of her foreign counterparts as well, regardless of, you know, uh, the policies. And they said, um, you know, she had a much tougher approach in meetings, it was very business-like, there was no chit-chat, there was no, how's your daughter, how's your family? Um, there was no, you know, 20 minutes talking with the Saudi king about camels. I was down to business. This is what we need. This is what we. C this is what we want. You know, how are you going to deliver? Um, it was more of an academic uh, approach, more lecturing. Um, and Clinton was more, you know, as we've been saying, more of the empathetic. Polit polit I mean, it's also political skill. Mm. You know, h how am I going to get you to do what I want you to do? Um, so. Is it you know part of her being a woman? I mean, it's you know it's all of her um, that, that that she brings to to the table, and you know I have no doubt that you know many men have the ability to empathize um, as well. Can you um, name any? Sorry. Can you name any? Um, <laughs> I, I'm sure you have. You're, you're, you're full of, full no, of no. empathy. <laughs> so, you know, President Obama today or or yesterday in, in, in Jerusalem with uh, with his speech. Um, when it comes to her relationship with, uh, with Bill Clinton, you know, as I said, this is not a pure biography of her. I don't go into any of those, uh, into any of those details. Um, I can tell you uh, from talking to some of her friends that she stayed in very regular touch with him, that they spoke often on the phone, that you know, they are very much um, connected. Uh, but there was also a sense that she had to distance herself from the couple and that she had to um, assert herself fully as her own person. You know, she's always been her own person in her own right, a lawyer of, you know, she, she was active as a first lady, she was a very political first lady, uh, but there was a sense that it was always, you know, Bill and, and Hill. And during her time as Secretary of State, she steered very much clear of the couple. It was just her. Uh, there weren't many moments or pictures of her um, with Bill, and, you know, sometimes I wonder whether was a conscious choice as well as just the fact that she was on the road um, all the time. And, you know, I'm sure that she, um, you know, um, th sought his advice because, you know, um, she sought the advice of many people who'd been in positions of power dealing with foreign leaders uh, before her, whether it was, call it, uh, whether it was um, her husband or whether it was Condoleezza Rice. You know, she called on Condoleezza Rice often to, you know, get the lay of the ground when she first, um, uh, came into power. But what I found interesting um, over the course of the four years is that she um, stopped being, you know, Clinton number two and became Hillary number one. Um, and I thought that the moment that um, uh, exemplified that best was during the Golden Globe Awards when the host on stage after Bill Clinton's speech says, oh my God, you know, that was Hillary Clinton's husband, <laughs> uh, you know. It, it used to be, oh my God, it's Bill Clinton's wife, and now it's, oh my God, it's you know um, Hillary Clinton's husband. So she's, you know, she is the politician turned stateswoman in her own right. I mean, she did it um, obviously as as a continuation of her career as lawyer, first lady, senator, um, but it was very much outside of the shadow of of her husband by the time that she finished her tenure. Take uh, one more question over here, and then. Um, you'll sign books afterwards. Sure. Thanks. Delighted to. Hi, Pascal Siegel at Insight Through Analysis. Um, do you think Hillary Clinton's approach to smart diplomacy 
is going to survive John Kerry, or is it gone with her? Um, I think the question is, is it going to survive uh, events? Mm. Um, because the best laid plans, you know, sometimes uh, don't work out because of events, because you're overwhelmed by the news, by, by, um, by change. Um, that's always a question. It's a struggle to maintain a certain uh, course, I find. Um, her approach to smart power was very much, um, uh, um, you know, she, she really tried to make the changes to her style. Sorry, let me rephrase that. She very much tried to make the changes she brought to the State Department and the style of diplomacy permanent. Um, so, you know, ambassador for women's issues is a permanent position at the State Department. Um, economic statecraft, part of the diplomacy. Um, global entrepreneurship program, part of the system. Uh, women's issues, gender issues, part of the budget. All of that has now been sort of, in essence, if you will, sort of codified in the way the State Department um, works. I won't bore you with the details of the QDDR, the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development uh, Review, but that's all, all part of trying to make the smart power approach something permanent. But then it depends, again, on style and leadership. Uh, you know, how is John Kerry going to take this forward? How much is he going to focus on it or not? Um, and also, it's important to keep in mind that I think, you know, it's, the jury is still out about whether it will work or not, this smart diplomacy, uh, smart power approach. It's being tested. It's a generational effort. Um, and we'll have to see whether uh, it takes root, whether those foundations to do diplomacy in that style in the 21st century, where America is still the biggest superpower, but not the only power, uh, whether all of that sort of gels and, and, and continues. Uh, but there was very much a feeling within the Obama administration that it was uh, worth trying and that it was the best way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.